Now, let me begin with the clarification. The very word state, as it is the subject of our discussion, is nowadays in most of the North Indian languages, including Hindi and also my mother tongue, Bangla, uh, it is called Rashtra in modern times. And this is often equated with the nation state. Now, the word Rashtra is of a very old usage, available to us right from the later Vedic texts. If we equate the term Rashtra with a modern nation state, does it mean that the very use of the term Rashtra in remote times lead us to think that the idea of a nation state was already German in early Indian thought. Now, this is a major problem. The use of certain words in Sanskrit language also change like many other things of ancient times. The term Rashtra in the earlier texts, remote texts of Sanskrit texts in remote times, never stood in the sense of what we mean by a very complex sovereign polity, what we call state nowadays. The term Rashtra in ancient Sanskrit treatises stands for a territory. It is equivalent to the term populated territory, Janapada. You will find that's why the term Rashtra, when we say Rashtra Kuta, it does not mean the head of the state. It means a political power that was a master over a particular territory. Take, for example, the term Rashtra will figure as one of the elements of the state in Manu Samhita. The term Rashtra will figure as one of the heads of revenue in the Kautilya Artha Shastra. Obviously, it cannot be the same as what we mean by a nation state or a modern sovereign state of our times. It's a Sanskritic, Sanskrit or Sanskritic word, but with a completely different meaning nowadays. And the change of connotations of the earlier times need to be taken into account. Now, we have also used the term state society instead of the term state. The point is, when we look at the changing perspective of the state, it is not merely the history of a, a, a particular structure continuing over ages without any change. It is not a static political situation. The term state society, as I began, it's connected with unequal access to power. And power is not merely political power. It's connected to one's social status, social position, one's the importance of one's religious ideology. These are all connected with the making of a complex society. So the term state society is connected with a Society that is sharply differentiated with hierarchy, unequal access to resources, and therefore it requires a political institution that is able to maintain some kind of an ordered society, even without ameliorating the social hierarchies and unequal access to resources. This is a term state society coined by the well-known historian and one of my teachers, Professor B.D. Chattopadhyay. And it's a complex socio-economic situation, political situation, with clear notions and practices of hierarchy and inequality and differential access to power. So the state is neither static, nor when we talk in the terms of state system, often the Historians of states, particularly of the historians prior to 1960s, there was a particular brand of historians, mostly coming from the colonial historiography, who denied the existence of a political society in early India. Early India being considered as steeped in otherworldliness, 
in religion, philosophy, only looking for emancipation from a terribly uh, sad, intransient world, then the nationalist historians, particularly with the help of the Shastric literature, and especially with the availability of the Arthashastra, began to point out that there was a distinct state system, highly centralized with bureaucratic structure, with a war machinery, and many of the features of a modern state had already been uh, approximated and already been conceptualized in remote times. And in the contestant understanding of the nationalist historiography, the ideal Indian state was a highly centralized monarchy. And if there were indications of decentralized polity, it was considered to be a period of political instability, a crisis leading to civilizational crisis. And the tendency is to look for centralization and decentralization of polity in the nationalist historiography. And the invariant political structure is that of a highly centralized states. The point is, particularly from 1980s onwards, the state is not seen merely as the description of an administrative system or a structure. It is connected from the emergence of the state apparatus, state as a political organization in a given society which requires the state. And that kind of a society is different from the pre-state societies, relatively simpler with more equitable distribution of available resources. I'm not telling fully egalitarian. That is not perhaps possible. There will be uh, differences in rank and status, but relatively less sharp differentiation in the access to resources and also the attending social ranking. And therefore, such simpler Pre-state societies did not require the institutional like state. The very emergence of the state society and its growing complexity is actually a narrative of the gradual changes from a relatively simpler pre-state society to a complex, sharply differentiated with hierarchized structure that leads to the making of the emergence of the state. The more common term in this context is the formation of the state. Moment to use the word formation, it covers both the sense of a process, that is a political process or processes, and the outcome of, the, of those processes in the context. Like when we say the word expression, formation of the monsoon clouds, it's a process. And when we say the formation of the council of ministers, it's the end product of a process which involves negotiation, many discussions, and then a formulation. So both these ideas are inherent in the understanding of the process of the concept of state formation and formation of the state. Now, the emergence of the state society in terms of our available evidence are, can be seen from around 6th century BCE with the emergence of the large territorial polities called Mahajanapadas, mostly seen in the North Indian plains and usually 16 in number. I would like to point out here, we shall, we are discussing largely the processes of the, the processes involved in the emergence and consolidation of the state system. And most states in earlier times were monarchical states, though 
non-monarchical polities were also well known and prevalent, though often unequal in strength and power vis-a-vis -vis the monarchical polities. In fact, in the Mahajanapada list of the 16, there were distinct Ganarajyas or non-monarchical polities, which are also called Mahajanapadas, that is large territorial pol polities. We have to keep in mind that the first territorial states are seen in the context of North India with a heavy concentration on the fertile Ganga plains. So this is an experience not of the entire subcontinent, but only with the North Indian plains to begin with, say, between 600 BCE and about 400, 350 BCE. Now, here, the term Mahajanapada obviously is connected to the term Janapada. If we look at the Arthashastra of Kautilya, the Janapada is definitely a populated territory. And it is, it consists of crucial resources called Janapada Sampath. And so the emergence of Mahajanapadas are inextricably linked with the ability of the emergent political power of resource mobilization. And since it is the, these Mahajanapadas are strewn over North Indian plains and particularly in the fertile Ganga basin, the most important resource would come from agriculture. 